Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so happy to be here with Brenda Earl Stokes. We are going to talk about her journey, uh, about how you know she helps musicians make money from music in ways that maybe you haven't thought of or by expanding some of your skills that can open up whole new markets to you. This is what I'm excited about. Um, this actually is really aligns well with some of my story. So we'll get into that as well. But um, just to start us off, Brenda, I'd love to know a little bit about your journey in music. And, you know, I know you, you, you're you a piano player, you have, you're very multifaceted. So I'd love to find out like how you started out, what made you focus on piano and voice and the way it kind of played out in your career. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so I did, you know, what I call middle class piano lessons from the time I was like five. <laughs> Me too. Um, that was the that was what we did. <clears throat> and both of my parents played a little bit and I was never super committed to it. Um, but when I was in high school, you know, I was it was in every band. I accompanied the choir. Um, you know, I sang in the choir. I played clarinet in the band. I was just completely obsessed with it. But piano hadn't really connected with me in that same way until my high school band director played a recording of Oscar Peterson, um, the jazz pianist. And I went, that's the thing. Like, that's it. That's what I want to do. As soon as I heard it, two notes of it, I went, this is it. This is the thing that's been missing. And so at that point, I really turned all of my attention to becoming the next Oscar Peterson. I practiced all the time. Um, I ended up moving to Toronto um, in Canada to go do my undergraduate degree, um, which actually was at a university, York University, um, where he was the chancellor of the university, Oscar Peterson was. So I got to know him a little bit, which was (laughs) kind of amazing. Um, And, you know, I I had done some singing through high school and, um, you know, and through elementary school, but it it was the era of Diana Krall and everyone kept saying, oh, you must be a singer. You must be a singer. And I just really wanted to be taken seriously as a pianist. So I literally was a closeted singer. I sang mm-hmm. in a closet <laughs> for four <laughs> years in an actual closet. And, uh, you know, I started to sing out after I graduated, um, started doing some jazz gigs, recorded my first EP CD um, around that time. And then from there, I decided it was time to get out of Dodge and I moved on to a cruise ship for a couple of years doing sing along piano bar. And, you know, if you want to learn how to be a professional musician, like a cruise ship piano bar is the place to do it, like to figure out an audience and songs. And, um, you know, so I did all of that for several years. And then I finally moved to New York to live the jazz dream, um, where I was, I did a master's degree in jazz piano and voice at Manhattan School of Music. And subsequently, I've done kind of everything. I've recorded a bunch of albums as a band leader. I've toured, I've played as a side person. I've music directed off Broadway musicals. I've taught elementary school and high school music. Um, and now I have my own um, online membership of online courses. So I kind of, I've done it all. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot. And so, you know, it's it's interesting, like you didn't identify with piano until you heard the thing and you're just like, yes, that's yeah. it. Like, that's it. And I think for me, it was like that with piano too. It was like I had when I had to play classical pieces, I'm like, yeah, like it's fine. Like it sounds pretty, you know, I just didn't get excited about it. And I think what got me excited about piano was accompanying my own songs that I wrote or being able to use it to like lead worship or whatever, since I was a church musician. And that's where I was like, okay, it's actually really worth it to learn how to play the piano because here's how I can use it. Mm 
And do you find that like a lot of musicians are like that? It's just like, oh, I took lessons for a few years and I have like basic skills, but I don't know how to actually apply these to something that could, you know, make me money. Right. Make them money or just find them, find the engagement or the, or the right. grip to it, you know, something to hold on to so that it can make sense. And, and I think because that was my story and because I have clearly have like some form of musical ADHD that I kind of do all the things in music, I'm sort of interested in everything. Like I was a choral conductor. I was a, a church organist. I, I've done all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, different stuff. And I think because of that, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with people, I always stop to say, let's figure out what's the thing like what's your Oscar Peterson moment let's let's give ourselves the peace and the space to figure that out and you know obviously if somebody wants to have a career in music there are certain things in general we want them to be able to do so we want to cover those bases and make sure that the literacy is there for whatever they plan to pursue but I think it's so important for people to really get a sense of like what's going to really make them excited and want to sit down at the piano or get in front of the microphone every day yeah, absolutely. And I'm assuming that literacy looks different depending on what you want to do, right? If you want to play jazz, you know, you need to know how to improvise. If you want to, uh, you know, be a side musician with other people, you need to know how to, you, you know, read charts, you know, that kind of thing, right? Or if you want to be a church musician, you need to know how to read sheet music, Exactly, exactly. And this is also where, um, you know, where I came into creating these online courses. You know, I, I have this series called Piano Skills for Singers. And what a lot of my singer friends, you know, I was very active in vocal pedagogy and my singer friends would kind of like take me aside and say, I have to confess, I'm super ashamed of my piano skills. They're really bad. They're really terrible. And I would sort of work with them in secret. Like nobody, I wasn't supposed to tell anyone they came for a lesson. And it was, it was like really under the shroud of night. It was, you know, a thing. And what I discovered, because I was never in any of the piano classes I tested out of them, what I realized is that what a lot of the colleges are, are teaching is actually not serving anyone. It would serve somebody who wants to be a musicology major or wants to be a theory person. I don't know what you do with that. But for somebody who wants to be a singer and be a professional singer, that stuff doesn't really serve you. We need something that is going to be more like, how do you sit down and play and how do you support what you're doing? Right. Why do I need to know all of my scales in four octaves? You know, that's the kind of thing that I had to do in college. And, and you know, why is it Bartok Microcosmos? Like, why does that book come out all the time? I have no <laughs> idea. Everyone's carrying it around. What in the world are you doing with that? Or Hannon exercises or... Oh, Hannon exercises. I remember that. I mean, you know, and, and what people end up, what ends up happening is the story that they start to tell themselves is, I couldn't do that, so I'm not a musician. Mm. And I, it, it affects, it affected me very deeply when I started con to connect with, with so many of my singer friends. And we're talking about people who tour with major acts, like major international touring acts. Um, they're backup singers, they're, you know, featured singers, people who have been nominated for Grammys who feel like they're not a good musician because they don't feel like they have those skills but it's because they feel dumb, but they weren't dumb. They were just taught stuff that wasn't helpful. Mm. And most of the time, is it that they're needing to learn because they need to like plunk stuff out on the piano that they're trying to learn how to play like or to, to sing? Or is it that they want to accompany themselves as a singer? Well, it's a bit of everything because I mean, uh, unless you're Adele, you're doing a bunch of things. So you need to, you know, a singer needs to have the piano skills to be able to do a p like a voice lesson. What is a voice lesson? You have to play exercises. You have to be able to teach your student their melody line. You have to be able to comp, like play chords or accompany them in a way that makes sense, you know, to be able to support and play something that is, you know, somewhat inspiring to the person singing. But then for you to also be able to accompany yourself while you're learning songs or, um, you know, if you're a church musician to be able to like hear all the parts, you know, play some of the parts and sing along um, or, you know, a songwriter to be able to play enough piano that you can create a harmonic landscape. So you're not always relying on the pianist in your band, the guitar player in your band. You know, my, my joke always with my singers is like, you don't have to marry a piano player. Like, <laughs> I want more for you. <laughs> don't marry a piano player. <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's find you someone else. So like, you know, to, to be able to be your own person um, and not feel like you have to rely so heavily on other people to make the music for you. So, you know, you're, the, it's women's empowerment. It's singer's empowerment. It's to make singers feel empowered that they can, they've got most of it. What they need is in themselves. Yeah, that resonates so much with my story because for me, it was, it was more like, I couldn't tour because all my band members had day jobs. Right. And so I was like, if I don't learn how to be a one woman show, I'm not going anywhere. Like I'm stuck here in Southern California to be able to do a few gigs on Friday and Saturday nights and maybe Sunday afternoon. And that is it. And then still I have to make sure that all five of the people in my band can make it. And it just, it was super frustrating to me because as the person booking, as the person wanting to get out there and do it, like, I didn't want to have to check with anyone. I wanted to be like, yes, I can do this gig. I'm, I'm all good. And so my struggle was, how do I play and sing at the same time? Because that was something that I just, I literally told myself it was impossible for me. Like, I can't do it. I could play. I could sing. I can't do it at the same time. How do you help, help people to overcome that? Well, I have a method that I have been working on for more than 10 years. I mean, it's, we're probably going to onto the 15 year mark of me deliberately teaching singers how to play. And so a lot of what it entails is a true mastery of chords. Um, not that you know what they are or you can figure them out, but that you can go ping, 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 ping. And they're all there in your hands, you know, mm -hmm. like just... <clears throat> like a, like a, just like Sonic the Hedgehog, like bing, 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 the chords. Um, <laughs> you can tell I'm a boy mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, then developing a series of rhythmic patterns that work for a wide range of songs. So, you know, you learn them one at a time, these simple rhythmic patterns that can approximate different sounds. So you've got something for a uh, a power ballad or a, just a general pop ballad, mm. something that would work for like Hello by Adele or Hey Jude by the Beatles or, you know, something that works. And then another one that works for sort of a mid-tempo pop rock. So if you're going to do Rihanna by um, Fleetwood Mac, do you have something that works for that? And oh, by the way, that works for every other medium-tempo rock song out there. Mm. You know, so b it's really building up a repertoire of accompaniment strategies that you have available to you and then the cherry on the top is to put a couple of identifying features for the song. So if that's the guitar line, um, if that's the, you know, like you think of Stairway to Heaven and that do, 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 you know, you just have to play that a couple of times and everyone thinks you're playing a direct transcription of the album. You know, and this is what I discovered when I was on the cruise ship because I was green when I went out there. I didn't really know anything. And people would come up to me and say, Oh my God, you've transcribed the whole record. It just sounds exactly like what whoever played. And I thought, Oh, that's interesting because I'm really totally completely faking it. I'm pulling it out of thin air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was I doing? I was playing enough of the hook, whatever the hook is. And then I was playing all the right chords and I was trying to sing it in a way that sounded like if I'm singing John Bon Jovi, it's got to have that quality to it. Um, and then, and then play a groove that comes close. And if you do that, everyone's happy. Everyone's happy. Yeah. I think the groove is where we struggle as pianists, right? Yeah. Because I mean, I, it's kind of like strumming patterns for guitarists. Right. And I know for me, like I tend to I arpeggiate like the same way all the time. So it's like, I don't want all my, all these songs to sound the same. Right. I have, I've put together, I've compiled a pretty elaborate collection of these. Mm. Um, and it's one of the things that I, you know, I include in all my courses and, you know, as a starting place. And I've now started creating tutorials for a whole bunch of different songs to show people, here's how you would break something down to, to make this. Um, and so, you know, there's a, a ton of variations of it, but a lot of times really, uh, I think most people could get away with, um, if they had maybe five or six of these rhythmic grooves and then just collected the rest of the identifying material, I think that would be enough for most people to be pretty satisfied. Mm. Yeah, just a few more tools in your toolbox. Just a do few you, more. Do you think it's important for singers that are learning piano to know how to transpose? 
or to be able um, to do it on the fly, you know? No, I don't think that's an important, I, I would put that further down the ladder of things mm -hmm. that I would want them to be able to do because most keyboards have a button that you can push. <laughs> and I'm all about, I'm all about triage. Like let's, let's stop the bleed. What do we got to do now? What's the next thing you need to do? What? Cause we don't, none of us have any time to, to do anything. You know, I realize how precious people's time is and how not only are as, as freelance musicians, like we have to do our social media and we have to send our newsletter out and we have to, you know, it's like booking gigs. And so if, if you're going to spend time, I would say that, Transposition would be something useful in some circumstances, but for most just gigging singers, I don't think it's, it's super, super necessary. Okay. That's good to know. I mean, yeah. it depends on what you're doing, right? If you're working with voice students and you need to be able to change the key because it's not working for their voice yeah. or what, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But yeah, like you said, you can use a keyboard. My problem is I just love playing the grand piano. So I want to be able to trans, you know, just change the key if I want. Um, yeah. But I mean, really the easiest way to do that, if you have a strong, strong enough sense of like the numerical harmony, um, then it's very easy to transpose. And yep. honestly, most of the professional pianists like myself, that's how we're doing it is we're totally, we're not, it's all that theory, gonna, all those theory yeah. classes that we took. <laughs> yeah. But they don't really teach that there either because they like, don't rules and stuff, you know, so you just think like, what is, let it be. It's one, five, six, four, one, five, four, one. That's right. let it be. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's how I think too. And I think yeah. that's because of my great theory training, but I, I can think in the, in the numbers and the relationships, mm -hmm. which is makes it, makes it possible. So yeah. I want to talk about something that you, you mentioned that I, I really, I really agree with, um, you know, you said like, you know, we're, we're having to be so focused on marketing all the time and, you know, that's important, but one really big and one of the most effective ways to market yourself is just be really good at being a musician and people will seek you out. And I've experienced this even, you know, now that I'm, I'm back in the, in the, in the public, right. I'm actually out there performing every week as a church musician, which I hadn't done for a few years. Um, and people start approaching you for all kinds of things. If you're good at that, they come to you. Oh, do you do weddings? Do you do funerals? Do you do, uh, will you teach my daughter voice lessons? Right. That all comes out of just being a really good musician. And that's what you help people do. Right. So can you kind of open people's eyes to like all the, all the income streams that are available to you once you just really become a great musician? Right. I mean, I, I, my experience for years, like before, really before I got into creating online courses, I never, I didn't even have a teaching website until like four years ago because I had, I was turning students away all the time. Mm. Like just as an example, because somebody would say, okay, why does she keep getting all the solos? And they're like, what's her secret? Well, I was their secret, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, being, being the best possible musician and doing a, a, a seeking every once every year to stop and say, where are the deficiencies? or every six months or every season to say, where do I feel that the deficiencies are in my playing, my ability? Usually it's the place that you feel y yucky when you have to think about it, you know, like people's rhythm or their sight reading or their piano skills and, you know, to flesh those out so that you can be indispensable. And so, you know, income streams where people can, especially singers, I mean, you think of things like... Um, uh, preschool music classes, like music mm. together, you know, you think about teaching voice lessons, running a chorus, like there, there are so many opportunities playing at your local coffee shop, playing at private events. It, it's almost an unlimited number of things that you can do in music if you have the skills. And if you can go out there as a, as a soloist, I mean, you, you can do anything. It's, it's, uh, there's really a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. And you talk about like diversifying your musical background. What do you mean by that? Do you mean like playing more instruments? Do you mean like different genres? I think the genres is a big one. Um, I think it's really important. And again, it depends on what you're doing, but if you are a voice teacher and you're classically trained, 
um, it's a great idea for you to expand out to have a breadth of understanding about contemporary styles and to know music theater, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a singer songwriter and you tend to write in one certain vein, it's a very, very good idea to really branch out wide into what other singer songwriters do. And I see this, especially in younger singers who are like, I just want to be the next Billie Eilish. And it's like, okay, let's start at Billie Eilish. We're going to bounce back to Tori Amos. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to listen to Kate Bush. Mm. And then we're going to, you know, so to have that breadth of understanding, because if your inspiration is too current or um, too narrow, then you're just going to sound like them. It's going to be a sound alike situation. But if you really, really want to have that breadth of knowledge, you need to do what the masters have done. I mean, this is, I just watched the, the Beatles documentary on Disney Plus, and they were talking about all the rock and roll, all the old songs. They were singing old folk songs. They were singing music theater songs. They were singing such a range of sounds and artists, they clearly, clearly knew their music inside and out. So why don't all of us do that? You know, why don't we all try to expand as much as we can within our own genre and outside? You know, there's, there's just so much to do it. And all this stuff is free. You just have to listen on Spotify or do a YouTube search and start to, you know, gather all your resources. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think especially as classically trained singer for me, I mean, luckily, I was also performing in kind of a pop and acapella group while I was in college, which mm -hmm. helped make sure that I didn't get stuck in that classical vein. But it's really, it's really easy to yeah. just not be able to sing pop all of a sudden because you've trained your voice in one way. Right, exactly. And if you do diversify this way, and you're learning the different styles and stuff, how do you then jump into suddenly being a performer of that style when you haven't done it before? Like what's the easiest way to kind of break into a new style when you don't have experience in that area? Well, I think a great way to do that is to find someone to mentor you into it. So, um, you know, frequently this is what I'm doing, especially with my college age students or my, you know, adult students or even high school students who are coming in that they have somebody that can walk them through it because that's why teachers exist. You know, we're here to simplify the process <laughs> for you so you don't have to like do all the stuff we had to do to figure it out. Um, another way is to spend time with other musicians who are in that field. Mm -hmm. So find a way to, um, you know, you can hire a guitar player to come and play with you so you can experiment with that. You could find a, a band in your area and ask to sit in with them. You could go to a jam session. You could go to an open mic. Um, they have a million camps out there. Like they have camps for grownups now where you could go mm. and spend a week doing jazz band every day or do a rock band program. So I think there's a ton of offerings out there of ways for you to get that knowledge. And then sometimes you just have to rip the band aid off and just put your set of 10 songs, invite people over to your house or your backyard, or, um, you know, ask your friend who owns the coffee shop if you can go do it and just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you do just have to do it. And that's, yeah, seriously, when you can have a house concert with your friends, why not? That's Absolutely. a good idea. Or even like live stream it to your Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. you know? That's something else we can all do. We all have a Zoom account, you know? So just to have somewhere or even put a secret YouTube channel up, like mm. hide, a, hide a YouTube video and send it out to some friends. So there's really a lot of ways to do these things that don't require you paying for a recording studio and, you know, having to do a whole put a kit together. You can just dip your toe in, you know? Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, is there anything else you wanted to cover while we're here as far as, you know, why they should really be diving into becoming the best musician that they can and how how piano skills can help vocalists? Yeah, I would say for any singers who are listening to this, of which I'm sure there's a ton, the the way that the shame can be built around these, the piano stuff, especially or the music theory, that doesn't that is something that was sort of created by the environment for us. 
Mm. You know, especially if you went to music school, singers were separated off to something else. It was sort of like the dumb class, the dummy class. I'm sure we've, we had these experiences or like not feeling like we're as good musicians as the instrumentalists around. This is this is a very, very persuasive, like a, a uh, pervasive. That's so issue. true. They always yeah. say like singers have no rhythm. You know what right. I mean? They say, I mean, there's a million jokes about singers. Yeah. And, you know, since this is a female empowerment, um, I'd just like to say that there is sort of a, a sexist connotation to all of this, that a huge majority of singers are women. And sometimes, especially in jazz programs, which is where I came through, the only women in the program sometimes were singers and they were treated as less than. Mm. And, you know, they didn't have a special class, dummies class for drummers, you know? It's, it's, there is something to that that's keeping, that's, that's really taking the empowerment away from women. And, and there's sort of a culture of shame around that. And so what I would say to people is that the shame doesn't have to be there. It's something that you can tackle at any point. And as long as you're working with somebody who is respectful of that and, and has the tools for you, you can get the skills that you need in a reasonable amount of time. And you don't have to feel that way anymore. You know, I'm a, I'm a believer definitely in, you know, mindset work and things like that. But a lot of times imposter syndrome is actually just a lack of skill. And if you can get rid of the imposter syndrome by just fixing whatever thing is making you feel like an imposter, that's like really, really helpful thing to do for your, your, just your life. Yeah, no, I agree. I, 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 I remember feeling that when I first started playing and singing together and I'm just like, I'm never going to be able to do this. Or I just, I wanted to hide behind the other instrumentalists because I knew that, I, you know, I wasn't good enough. And like, I finally, I just had to like buckle down and do it. And I had to get, I had to actually schedule a performance, which was my first time um, playing and singing together. And I had to use a crutch. Like I did on a couple of songs, use a backing track and play along. But I got through it and I was like, I didn't make that many mistakes. Okay, next time I'm going to take away the backing track from this song, you know, and, and then eventually after a few times I was able to to do it. But like you sometimes you just like you said, rip off the Band-Aid. But also I like I had to say like, hey, I'm never going to be able to do this if I don't like buckle down and say this month I'm going to practice every day for an hour. I'm going to practice in front of my kids so they can, you know, I I, I feel like there's somebody paying attention when I make mistakes because it's different right. than when you're practicing just you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's something that, you know, it, a year could go by and you could still be feeling the same way. But if you started to spend 10 minutes a day, you know, this is something in the Atomic Habits book. You know, mm, it's clear. Book, love like, that book. 10 minutes a day. 10 minutes a day, like 10 minutes a day in a week, that's, that's more than an hour. You know, it, by the end of the year, that's a ton of hours. You just think of 10 minutes a day, how much further you could be. And in a year from now, it could be a completely different story. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm a big believer of like, just do it, do the thing. You'll figure out the details, find a partner or somebody who can help you, someone who can support you. And you know, what's the worst thing that could happen is that you could learn how to actually accompany yourself <laughs> and feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. Well, this has been awesome. And I think so empowering for many of the people watching and listening. So how can people connect with you online on um, your website and social media channels? Absolutely. So my website is piano and voice with Um, there is the hub for all the things I have like 200 blog posts on a whole bunch of Ooh. different resources. I have a lot of free printables and downloads. Um, you can learn about my membership site, the versatile musician, which is my online home for all of my tutorials and my piano skills for singers, um, courses, all of that is there. Um, on there, you can also find my YouTube channel. I have, uh, 200 and something videos on there. Um, and then on Instagram, I met Brenda Earl Stokes and I don't, I'm on Facebook somewhere as Brenda Earl Stokes too. <laughs> Oh, gosh. I'm around. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, this has been so great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge and experience with our audience. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real, real fun time. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. 
leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 